This morning, I want to call your attention to a passage in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I'm going to begin reading there in just a moment, verse 12. But let me tell you what's happening in this, in this chapter. We're seeing a description of someone who is worshiping God. And so I really believe the Lord wants me to talk with you today about real worship. And I use the word real in the sense that we used it when I was a kid, where, where if you were really serious about something, you would look at somebody and you'd say, hey, let's get real. <laughs> you, you, you with me? And so I'm saying, let's talk about worship, but let's get real. Let's talk about what worship really is. And what we're going to discover this morning is worship goes far beyond something that we give a few minutes to on Sunday morning. Uh, worship is all-encompassing. It consumes our whole life properly understood. And so that's what we're going to be doing this morning is looking at that. In this passage of Scripture, we're looking at a man named King David. David, in the Old Testament, was the second king that Israel had. And, and he didn't come into that assignment easily. King Saul was the first one, and he resisted David becoming the king. Uh, Saul had initially followed the Lord, but then he fell out of favor from the Lord when he uh, focused on himself and, and cared too much what other people thought instead of what God thought. And, and so he resisted David. David was on the run. David was pursued by Saul. And meanwhile, so when Saul finally died, David became king, a part of Israel, and then he had to really work to become king of all of Israel. And then after he became king of all of Israel, he had to deal with all of these enemies that kept attacking well, at this particular moment, David has established Jerusalem as his capital. And, and he's consolidating his leadership there. And for the very first time, he's pretty much at peace. A lot of the enemies of Israel have been subdued. And, and as he's building his own house, he begins thinking, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, and those of you, you know, familiar with, Raiders of the Lost Ark and stuff like that. You, the Ark of the Covenant is that box that contained the Ten Commandments, the, the very Ten Commandments that God wrote on, the Decalogue, those Ten Commandments, they were inside. And it was a symbol and it was representative of the presence of God and his promise that Israel would be his people. And this was not in Jerusalem. This was outside at, at another encampment and uh, it wasn't in a building, it was in a big tent. And David wanted to bring the ark of God into the city of Jerusalem. So they attempted it. First time they did it, they put it on an ox cart, a little wagon. And which was a, a terrible neglect of scripture. Because God had given clear instructions way back in Numbers that everything else associated with the tabernacle, all of the religious instruments and materials could be carried on wagons, but the ark had to be carried on poles on men's shoulders. And the ark being carried on the men's shoulders, there was a certain group of men, a subset of priests called the sons of Kohath. They were Kohathites, and they could carry the ark of God on their shoulders with these poles. Nobody else was allowed to do that because it represented the presence of God. You couldn't even touch it. But someone had failed to read the Bible. And so when they got ready to do it, they put it on an ox cart, which represented a kind of innovation, if you will, in how we're going to relate to God. God said, carry it on poles. We're going to put it on an ox cart. Dear one, you cannot dictate the terms of your relationship with God. We come to him on his terms, and we don't get to come. The beautiful thing is, is he has a way for us to come to him. And the door is wide open because his son dies for us on the cross and carries away our sins. But this is before that. This is Old Testament. All the rules were laid out. And if you're going to have a relationship as a sinner with a holy God, we've got to do it this way. And so this was a very communicating something very serious about how to have a relationship with God. We carry it on poles. We don't touch the thing. They put it on an ox cart. Now, where did they get the idea to put it on an ox cart? In the previous book, 1 Samuel, in chapter 6, there was this moment where the ark of God got stolen by the Philistines. They carried it to their hometown. 
And while it was there, because it wasn't supposed to be there, God wreaked all kinds of havoc on the Philistines. They got sick. They, uh, their kids got sick. Their idols kept falling down and breaking. and It was a nightmare. Everything went wrong in their culture and their society because they had the ark of God. They weren't supposed to have it. And uh, so if you don't think God can't take care of his own business, I mean, that's a good one to read, 1 Samuel 6. Well, when they got ready, they said, you know, we think God's not happy with us, the Israelite God, that he's not happy with us. So here's what we're going to do. This is a test. We're going to take two milk cows who have calves, babies. We're going to take the babies home. We're going to take the milk cows and attach them to an ox cart with the, the Ark of the Covenant on it, and we're going to see where they go. And if it's really the Israelite God, they'll go to Israel. That's exactly what happened. They left their babies that they were, you know, nursing behind. They pulled that ox cart, lowing all the way, the Bible says, moo, moo, moo. And they carried it all the way back to Israel. That's where they got the idea to use an ox cart. It had never been done before that way. So they used this ox cart. They put the ark of God on there. And they're rolling along, and all of a sudden, the ox cart, which wasn't real stable to begin with, hits a bump in the road, and the ark of God that contains the Ten Commandments of God is sliding off the back. And a man standing there, his name was Uzzah, did what every one of us would have done at that moment. He lifts his hand up to stop the disaster of the ark falling off the back and breaking on the ground. And the Bible says the moment Uzzah touched the ark, he died. David was devastated. What did we do wrong? Why would God be unhappy with us? And, and he went back to Jerusalem. He just stopped everything. They left it right where it was, <laughs> wouldn't you? And, and, they, and he goes back to Jerusalem. He gets the religious scholars studying, and they realize, oh, we weren't doing it right, <laughs> and we're supposed to have these guys carrying it on poles, and they were supposed to be Kohathites. Any Kohathites here? I mean, they we're supposed to do this a certain way, and and meanwhile, while he's doing that, the ark of God is left at a guy's house. His name's Obed-Edom. And they leave the ark at his house. And the whole time that the ark is there, Obed-Edom is blessed. His crops flourish. His wife has 25 kids. I don't know what happens. He's just blessed. I mean, everything's overflowing. And he's having a great time because the ark of God, the presence of God, is associated with this man and his property. And so when we come to 2 Samuel 6... We come to this passage of Scripture in uh, verse 12, and this is what we read, what happens next. Okay, you ready? Verse 12, now it was told King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God, doing it correctly this time brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And boy, what an understatement. We'll see that in just a moment. But it says with gladness. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you for the opportunity we have to listen to your voice and to hear what you have to say to us about our own hearts and about worship. Open the eyes of our heart today. Grant to us a fresh vision of Jesus. Enable us to see him. Cause us to realize that with our eyes on him, we can walk over the raging seas and over everything that threatens us at any given time. But if we'll just keep our eyes on him. Lord, teach us to worship today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to frame this discussion about worship today around two questions. They're simple questions. So the first one is this. What happens when worship gets real? Remember, we're going to talk about the reality of worship. So what happens when worship gets real? So there's a couple reactions in the presence of God and true worship taking place. People respond in different ways. So the first response we read, when hap what happens when worship gets real, the first response is, number one, like David, some react by dancing. Look at verse 14. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. 
He was bringing it up with gladness. I told you that was an understatement. He's dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod, not royal garments. He was wearing this plain gown. So David and all the house of Israel, and if you go back to verse 1 of this chapter, it's 30,000 men. So it's not counting the women, not counting the children and all the relatives and spectators. There are 30,000 men in the street with David. Okay? So all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of trumpet. I told the early, early church, I, I was, uh, we were in a church a number of years ago in Baton Rouge, and we had, we were all contemporary worship in that particular church. That was the worship form that was there. And so we had two services, one at 8.30, like you all. And we had people complain about the drums during the 8.30 service being too loud. Now, I'm sure that's never happened here. And a dear brother came up to me and said, those drums are just too loud at 8.30. And I looked at him and I said, everything's too loud at 8.30. <laughs> the worship at this moment was loud. David's true colors are exposed. He is a worshiper of God. And nothing can contain that heart that is devoted to God and is sensing his presence David is responding to him, but what I want you to hear is this is not some kind of formal ritualistic dance. This is a guy that, as the women where I grew up would have said, this guy is out of his ever-loving mind, you know? He, he, on a heart level, cannot help what he's feeling and what's happening to him. There was a point in the ministry of Jesus where he's talking to the Pharisees and they're having a debate about something and he turns to his disciples and he quotes a verse from the Old Testament and he says, this people honors me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. And right away we realize it's possible to say the right words and sing the right words and not worship. What the Lord wants from you and me is going to happen on a heart level in your inner self. I don't know what I may see or not see in you this morning. I've met people that I thought were just totally as mean as a snake, you know, on their face. They just look terrible. But they turn out to be some of the sweetest, you know, people that you would want to know. So you can't, you can't always judge a book by its cover, right? But the Lord doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the inside and... David, on a heart level, was exactly where the Lord wants you and me to be. He wants us, on a heart level, to worship him. So what does that mean? Does it mean you have to dance like David? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, I know that when you came here today, you did not anticipate that a Baptist preacher would teach you how to dance. But I want to talk to you this morning about David's dance steps to true worship, real worship. And what does that look like? Okay, so let's just sort of dissect it a little bit in terms of what was happening to David at this moment on a heart level. So here's the first step to true worship. Step number one is reverence. Reverence, an awareness of the presence of God. An awareness of the presence of God. So you would look at me if you were a Bible scholar or a theologian, you would say, well, Don, God is everywhere. So what are you talking about? I mean, we talk about the omnipresence of God, and by that, what we're saying is that God is everywhere. That there's no place I can go where God is not. When I drove here this morning from Covington, it took about 30 minutes from where I live, and when I left Covington, God was in Covington. I know that because I spoke to him when I left. Okay? So God's in Covington. So I drive over here, and when I get here, God is in Hammond, Louisiana also. Because I know that because when I got out of the car in the parking lot, I spoke to him. Okay? So, but here's the deal. I traveled. He did not. He doesn't travel from Covington to Louisiana. Certainly not just because I'm driving, you know. <laughs> he's already there. It's because he's big, y'all. 
God's big. There's no place you can go in the universe where he is not. And so in the strictest sense of it, if I talk about becoming aware of the presence of God, it's saying more about you than him. He's here. What's changing is my awareness, my recognition of his presence. And that's the first step to true worship. I've got to hit pause and, and acknowledge the presence of God. And that should affect me on some level. I should recognize his presence. Um, in the Old Testament, we read, be still and know that I'm God. I, when I talk to people about how to spend time alone with God, the very first thing I would encourage you to do is this. Just stop everything. Don't pick up your Bible. Don't read anything yet. Don't pray anything yet. Don't say anything yet. Just be still. And recognize the presence of the Lord. If you start there, you're going to be okay. Was that happening to David? Oh, yes. He was recognizing the presence of the Lord because the ark of God that represented the very presence of God was being brought to the city of God for the first time. And he was not just recognizing the presence of God, dear one, he was experiencing the presence of God. And that's even better. But it starts by just recognizing God is here. That's a choice. That's a starting point for true worship. Second step, dance step to true worship. Number two, surrender. Surrender. This is natural response to the presence of God. It's an inward bowing down to God. An inward bowing down to God. If I recognize his presence and I recognize I'm dealing with the ruler of all things, the king of kings, the lord of lords, and he is my God and he is my father, how do I respond to that? Well, you surrender. You yield yourself to him. You give yourself to him. You don't hold anything back. And what's really fascinating is the words, if you ever do a word study, of words that are translated worship in the Old and New Testament. It's really interesting because particularly in the Old Testament, there are multiple Hebrew words that we all translate as the word worship or serve. And, but yet they're different Hebrew words. What's really interesting is that those Hebrew words pretty much have the same picture, word picture, embedded in the language. One example. In the Old Testament, one of the words for translated worship or serve is the word shakah. Shakah. If I said it right, it kind of would spit and clear my throat. Shakah. I mean, it's just shakah. We'll would leave it there. And so this word first appears in Genesis, uh, I think it's 18, where Abraham encounters the three men who are coming, they're angels, the three men who are coming to tell Abraham and Sarah they're about to have a child in their 90s and the hundred and so forth. I mean, they're, they're really, excuse me, they're really old, and they're going to have a baby. And these three men, angels, are coming to announce this reality, this fact. And the Bible says Abraham sees them, recognizes who they are, what they represent, and he runs, and it says he shakaz, or bounds down before them. And, and so this is what it looks like, okay? The core conception of the word shakah, translated serve or worship, is to bend at the waist like this, or to get down in the bend like this. And it's translated worship. You getting the idea? Let me give you another example. Using the word shakah, it's, it's that moment where Moses is given instructions on what to say to Pharaoh. And it says in Exodus 7, verse 16, You shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve or worship or shakah me. The whole deliverance from Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, was so that his people could do this to him, before him. When you come to the New Testament, the idea is pretty similar. The word used for worship during the temptation of Jesus is a great illustration of that. The devil is tempting Jesus in Luke chapter 4. The Bible says that he, the devil, led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. 
And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. By the way, if you ever wondered who has the greatest influence over the nations of the earth, you just got your answer. Because the devil in this moment is offering to Jesus directional control of all the nations of the planet. He doesn't have to die on a cross. The devil's saying, I'll give you the whole planet, all the governance of the earth, if you'll fall down and worship me. He could not do that unless it was a real and a legitimate offer. There's no temptation if he was just kidding. It was tempting because he had the ability to do that. And so in the face of that temptation, he's being told, Jesus is being told, if you'll fall down and worship me. So what does that look like? Well, let me go over here. You may not be able to see. I think most of you can see. Yeah, this is good. Right here. So let me show you. The word for worship that's used there is a Greek word, proskuneo. I'll give you all the nations of the world, Jesus, if you will fall down and proskuneo before me. Here's proskuneo. Okay, proskuneo. By the way, as you get older, proskuneo takes more time. Okay, here's proskuneo, proskuneo, proskuneo. means to lie on your face before someone else of greater authority, power. It's total, complete surrender. Everything. And the word proskuneo is two words. One word is pros which means towards, and kaneo means to kiss. It means to lead with the lips. And the only way you can lead with the lips is if, unless you can suspend yourself in the air, is to lie flat on the ground with your, you know, lips forward, to lie on your face. And that's what the devil was saying. If you'll do this, totally surrender to me. I'll give you everything that you want. So, do you realize now that what we just did when we sang earlier may very much be part of worship? But worship is something that goes well beyond singing on Sunday morning. Worship is 24-7. Worship is what we're called to. I talked about it last week when we're called to abide in Christ, to maintain a constant inner conversation with Jesus, to have a relationship with him that's all day long, all the time. And all the time saying, Lord, I give you everything. I yield everything to you. Was David doing that in this moment? He experienced or encountered the presence of God. His reaction, which is a normal one, is to yield everything to him. Do you know, dear one, that one day the Lord Jesus is going to reveal himself to every person on the planet? And it says every high shall see him. At that particular moment when he reveals himself, it says every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Does that sound like yielding to him? It'll be too late for people, for some people. I mean, the time to trust Christ is over. But when he's manifested as who he is in all his kingly glory and his power and his majesty, we yield. That's the proper response. And David was encountering something of the presence of God. And he was surrendered to the Father and that's what we're called to in worship. Now, so that means that just looking at you, I can't tell if you're worshiping because it's something that happens on a heart level. Your lips may be moving, <laughs> but is your heart engaged? Is your heart engaged? The third dance step of true worship, I'm going to use the word expression. Expression. If, if I'm sensing the presence of God, recognizing it, and I'm responding by yielding to him everything, bowing down to him every area of life, that comes out. That comes out in the way I talk, the way I treat people, the way I act. In this case, the way I worship. David is dancing before the Lord. I know that wasn't pretty. But I'm sure he was in great shape and he was more robust but it's expressed. In Psalm 16, verse 11, David would write years later, 
he said in that last verse of Psalm 16, in thy presence is fullness of joy. He knew that. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, pleasures forevermore. The presence of God cannot be contained in the human heart. Something comes out. It's expressed. It's expressed somewhere. Our countenance, our words, the way we treat people, the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about that last week. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But that heart-level worship comes out. It's expressed. So we see those dance steps, reverence, surrender, expression. That's true worship, when worship gets real. Some people react to the presence of God, to true worship, by dancing. We see that in David. But there's another reaction, the reaction of a non-worshipper. Like Michael, some react to dancing. They don't like it. Look at verse 16. Then it happened, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing, there he goes, before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Wow. Verse 20. But when David returned to bless his household, and, and that's just the way it is, isn't it? Something really cool happens in a day. You're coming home. Let me tell you what happened today. He's just going to bless them. I want, I want to make everybody happy because I was happy today. He comes home to bless his Lord, his household. And then Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. I think she's being sarcastic. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. And she's reacting as a non-worshipper. And we see this in two things. First, the non-worshipper observes worship without experiencing worship. The Bible says she was watching from a window. She wasn't in the street with David, her husband, worshiping God. There was nothing on a heart level with her. She wasn't recognizing the presence of God. She wasn't honoring God. She was watching. And if you're not careful, you can watch other people love God without loving him yourself. And so that's where she was. That's being honest. That's what she was about. She was not engaged. Maybe on the outside, she looked Jewish. She looked dedicated. She was the queen. She was married to David, but she was not a worshiper of God. Second observation about Michael. The non-worshiper rejects worship as a threat. The Bible says she despised him in her heart. You know, when I'm around somebody that loves Jesus, my heart just goes, wow, man, that's, I want to hang with that, that guy. I want to be with that person because they love the Lord, and I love the Lord. And it's just fun to be with other people who love the Lord. But she saw what he was doing, and she despised him. She saw no credibilities, no value. She saw what was happening in David's life as a threat. He was embarrassing himself. He was demeaning himself. He was not weighty, kabod, distinguished. He was a shameful fool out there in the street acting like that. And she was critical in her heart, despised him in her heart. She wasn't loving the Lord in her heart. Dear one, what a cautionary tale for you and me. I've been doing this Baptist preacher thing for a long time well over four decades. And, and when I came to know Christ, we were see, singing cheesy choruses, you know, on a guitar. I thought they were beautiful. And then as I continued to grow in the Lord, I just, I, people were singing hymns in, in churches, and I was raised in another tradition. I didn't know these hymns, but I learned a bunch of them, but I, I didn't know these hymns. I continued, and, and uh, contemporary Christian music began, became a thing. 
And so we started singing songs on the radio, and eventually some of those songs started working their way in the church. And we started singing those songs in church. Um, got to a place where I discovered that churches weren't happy with one another because some people liked songs, certain songs, and other people didn't like the other songs. And I thought, well, what's the deal? Until I decided, no, I didn't like those songs either. I like my songs. I like my songs. I don't like their songs. And it's really bizarre when you start thinking about what we're discussing here this morning when we talk about worship, where our focus, our entire focus is to be on the Lord, that we become so preoccupied with my music and my preference that I absolutely lose any sense of worship altogether. I'm not even dealing with God at that point. I'm just kind of dealing with my style, you know, that I like. So 20 years ago, I started work at the Arkansas Baptist State Convention, and I had to travel a lot. And one of the first assignments I got and, uh, was at an a old-fashioned tent revival with sawdust on the floor outside Mammoth Spring, Arkansas. It was in a suburb, which means it was a cow pasture. And, and a couple hundred people were gathering there in this, this tent revival, and I was speaking. Some guy from Little Rock, you know, they don't even know who I am. So before the service each night, they pull out, they just have sort of a hootenanny. I mean, they're, they're going to sing, and they, they grab their dulcimers, and they grab their hill instruments from those arcs, you know, all these different instruments, and they're singing uh, their gospel music, bluegrass and other things. They're singing their gospel music. But here's the thing that struck me as a, as a new guy traveling around Arkansas, was that as these people were, were playing these old hymns, that none of you would know because they were rooted there in the Ozarks and they never left, playing these old hymns that had never gotten anywhere, but they are playing this music and singing the hymns. I'm watching people whose eyes are closed, whose hands are open, whose hands are raised, people who are bowed and, and, and others who are just trembling. They're worshiping. I can see it in the expression of what was going on that was coming out of their hearts. And the Lord spoke to me and gave me a, a very clear instruction and a warning that I used for the next 10 years. And I still do it today. Which is, Don, whenever you travel to a church, whatever they're giving you musically, use that to worship me. Whatever vehicle they offer you, get in it and worship me. If it's hymns, heavenly highways, something you never heard of, if it's well done, maybe not so well done, it doesn't matter. You take it and you worship me. That's what I did for 10 years. I stopped worrying about whether it was good or bad, whether I liked it or didn't like it. I just said, it's Sunday. I get a chance to worship with some brothers and sisters. Let's worship the Lord. And so every Sunday was a different musical experience. Sometimes it was cultural whiplash, going from one to the other. Didn't matter. I just worshiped the Lord. It's a choice. It's a choice. Heaven help you if you are ever critical of someone else worshiping God. That was Michael. She despised him in her heart. That's not worship, dear ones. It's not. There's no way you can have unity around song preferences. You can unify it by making a fundamental commitment in your heart. Today, I'm worshiping God. I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> but I'm going to worship the Lord. So Michael is a non-worshipper. So how is David going to respond to this? Well, that brings me to the second question. The first question was, what happens when worship gets real? And we see that when worship gets real, some people react by dancing like David. Other people react to the dancing like Michael. Okay? So now the second question that I want to pose to you is this. And this is what every good preacher, Bible teacher ought to do, is we've got to bring it home. We've got to apply it to our hearts, right? Right? So the second question is this. When will your worship get real? When will your worship get real? Let's not talk about it academically or theoretically. Let's talk about you. When will your worship be real? Listen to how David responds to Michael 
the critic and the worship expert that she thought she was. 2 Samuel 6, verse 21. <laughs> so David said to Michael, it was before the Lord. Who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. And just like her daddy, she cared more about what people thought than what God thought. So when will your worship get real? I think we can get some real strong direction from what David just said. First, your worship will get real. Hey, by the way, i got to give a warning. Go ahead and bring up that warning. I don't put warning labels on sermons, but I do on this one, okay? Warning, you will find yourself dancing like David when? So if you don't want to hear this, if you don't want to dance like David, you better just leave or put your fingers in your ears and hum quietly to yourself because this is dangerous stuff right here that I'm about to give you, okay? All right, number one. You'll find yourself dancing like David when, number one, the only audience you care about is Jesus Christ. David says it was before the Lord. So think with me about what he just what he's saying to her. Michael, you think I was worried about what everybody else thinks. But it wasn't about those 30,000 men and the women in the street and the maids that were dancing nearby. It wasn't about that. It was before the Lord. And literally that language before the Lord means before the face of God. It was before the Lord. It was just him. I didn't I wasn't even thinking about those other people. I wasn't thinking about what they would think of me. I, it was just before the Lord. And I don't know of anything that will set a person free more than when you come to the conclusion that there's only one person that has to be happy with you. It doesn't matter if anybody else is happy. If, there's, if the Lord is happy with you, that's all you need. That's it. Everybody doesn't have to like me. The Lord loves me. And if I'm seeking his heart to please him, it doesn't matter what you think. Most of you will like me because I'm doing what I believe the Lord wants me to do. And if I'm doing love, joy, peace, long suffering, if I'm doing those things, a lot of people are going to get along with me, but some people won't like me. It's okay. It will set you free if the only person you have to please is the Lord, and you can walk into a room full of strangers, and it doesn't matter what they think. You can just smile and go up and introduce yourself and start to meet people because you don't have to please them. You've got to love them, but you don't have to please them. In Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said, if I was still trying to please men... I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. You can't do both. You can't do both. So, you'll dance like David when the only audience you care about is Jesus Christ. Number two, you'll dance like David when you experience a living God at work in your life. Verse 21, he says it was before the Lord. Then he tells us something about the Lord. It was before the Lord who chose me to appoint me ruler. So God did something in David's life, and that recognition of what God had done was why he was able to dance the way he did. I imagine it went something like this, because this is what he was intimating when he spoke to Michael. He said, Michael, you've got to remember where I came from, sweetheart. When I started out, I was the youngest of eight boys in Jesse's house, my daddy. And my job was to take care of the sheep, the job nobody else wanted. When Samuel came to my house because God sent him there to anoint the next king of Israel, my dad brought all the other brothers out first. Brother number one, brother number two, brother number three, brother number four. Got all through all seven of my other brothers. And Samuel had to ask my dad, do you have any other sons? 
My dad said, oh yeah, David. Years later in Psalm 27, David would write, though my mother and father forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. He said, Michael, you've got to remember what God did for me. He took me. He took me out of the pasture. He took me as a shepherd. I was a nobody. I was never going to be anything. And God made me a king. He did something in my life. He changed me. He's using me. It was before the Lord who chose me above your dad. And the truth is, every person here that knows Jesus as Lord and Savior, your story is the same. You were in darkness. You were in bondage to sin. You would never have chosen Christ if he had not first come to you and opened your heart. You were born again because of his mercy and his grace. He called you. You heard him. He opened your eyes. Paul would later write in Colossians verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, he has lifted us out of the kingdom of darkness and he has conveyed us or placed us in the kingdom of his Son. Hallelujah. It was before the Lord who saved me. He did something in my life. That's your story too. And if you don't realize that, boy, you got to go home and think, think harder about what's going on. And so when you realize all that God has done and all that God is doing, you're going to worship like David. David was profoundly conscious of the awesome things that God had done in his life. And the third thing, last thing I want to mention is you'll find yourself dancing like David when inner devotion, heart-level devotion, inner devotion overwhelms your need to protect or promote self. We get in a lot of problems with God and with others because we're trying to protect or advance self. But worship doesn't do that. Worship doesn't do that. Listen to what he says in verse 20 to Michael, who's so worried about everybody else. He says, I will celebrate before the Lord. That word celebrate is describing an uncontrollable emotion that wells up inside you and has to find release, has to come out. I likened it in first hour to a time in a prayer meeting when I was in college, and they were talking about some somber prayer need, some, some dark thing happening to somebody. They had cancer, something terrible, and I got the giggles. It wasn't because of the testimony. It was because I got the giggles over something stupid. I don't even remember what it was, but I couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. My wife is pinching my leg. I couldn't stop. People are looking over the pews. What's wrong with that kid? I got up and left the building. I couldn't control it. So I just had to leave. When David looks at her and says, I will celebrate before the Lord, that's what he's saying. He's saying, dear, dear lady, I got this going on inside me. I can't stop. He goes on and expands on it. He says, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will be more lightly esteemed, that means undignified, than this and will be humble, literally humiliated in my own eyes. Sister, you thought it was bad today. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. It's only going to get worse. My worship of God is going to get to a place that you are going to find intolerable because I love him with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that's going to come out, and I don't care what you think or what anybody else thinks. I only care what he thinks, and he deserves my full devotion and allegiance and everything that I have because of what he's done for me. So do you feel like dancing this morning? Oh, I'm this close. It wouldn't be pretty. But i got to finish the sermon. So how do we respond to this reality of worship? Get it off the page and get it from being just a word that we say or something we confine to a few minutes on Sunday morning. How does worship become every moment of every day? When I was seven years old, my mother was a single mom. We were living in a mobile home in South Texas. We lived outside San Antonio where I grew up. And being a single mom, we didn't have a lot. I, uh, I grew up, my mom didn't know where I was. I was a free-range child by every definition of it. 
I was all over the place. I was on everybody else's property except our own, messing with their horses and dodging electric fences and crawdad fishing barefoot all summer long, running on shell gravel. My feet were tough. I could not do that now, you know. One hot summer day, it was a Saturday, I think, um, it was really brutally hot in the summer in that part of Texas, and it was really hot that particular summer. My mom goes to the store and brings home one of these. Go ahead and bring this up on the screen. A slip and slide. How many of y'all have ever used a slip and slide? Yeah, y'all are more educated than the first hour. <laughs> more hands went up this time. So, so yes, you are an educated group. So we got that slip and slide out. We were so excited. <laughs> We rolled that plastic out, we took the metal stakes and we staked that plastic down to the ground. We hooked it up to the hose. That water is sprinkling up in that hot Texas sun and landing on the yellow plastic. And I'm seeing rainbows all the through there at my seven year old height. I can just look through there and see this beautiful experience waiting for me. And it was exactly that. We would run and slide on the slip and slide on our tummies, on our backs, we would flip. We would ride each other, we'd push each other down in an Indian position, whatever it was. If there was a way to move and position yourself on there, we did it. And we would slide and slide and slide all day long, each time the slide terminating in that warm brown mud puddle that would form at the end of the slide. Jump ahead now 20 years. I'm 27. Not today. Then. No longer seven. Now I'm 27. We're living in Lake Charles, Louisiana. It's another hot summer day. My kids can't go outside and play in the shade because we've got mosquitoes that will carry off those children. And so we, we, we're trying to figure out something. I felt sorry for my girls, seven and five, my oldest two at that time, or maybe anyway, seven-ish, five-ish, six, four-ish, I don't know. And I said, girls, go put on your swimsuits. I'm going to run to the store. And remembering what my mom did, I grabbed a slip and slide and brought it home. And my girls were so excited. They had their little swimsuits on, their little towels, and they're standing on the sidewalk in front of their house. And I start rolling out the yellow piece of plastic. And as I'm staking that into the ground and hooking the hose up and watching that water sprinkle through the hot Louisiana sun on that yellow plastic, and I'm seeing those rainbows, I'm having flashbacks to what it was like when I was seven. And so my girls are saying, Dad, Dad, what are, you do? You know, what are we going to do? You know, we want to try it. You know, they saw the picture. That's obvious what you're supposed to do. We want to do it. And I said, wait, 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 girls, wait. Let me show you how it's done. <laughs> so they waited patiently on the sidewalk, and I backed up, and I run at the yellow plastic. And I want you to know at age 27, a judge, a, adult judgment has just been formed, if at all. And so I didn't lay down on that plastic. I went airborne. Age 27, thinner, lighter, better looking version of what I am now. But I did go airborne and I landed on the plastic, boom! But I didn't slide. I just landed and it knocked all the wind out of me. I couldn't breathe. I literally rolled over on the grass. My girls come running up and they're laughing at me. I said, girls, it's kind of like that, you know. And they had a grand time after that. So how does your father want you to respond to this truth about worship? Like a seven-year-old boy in the hot Texas sun, he wants you to run, dear one. He wants you to run and throw yourself at his feet. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? What we've talked about today will be the eternal activity of every Christian in heaven. This is what we're going to be doing for all eternity. It's not something that begins in heaven or something we dabble in on Sunday. This is a way of life. To live your life aware of the presence of God. In the Old Testament, when God was manifesting himself, people fell down. But if you're a Christian today, God is always with you. Always with you. You should always be in a posture of worship. Always be responding to him. 
by yielding yourself completely to Him. And whatever comes out after that is just fine. And this morning, as we respond to Him, right where you're seated, would you just take a moment in your heart and recognize His presence, acknowledge Him. Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Savior of my soul. The one who holds the plan for my life and all the steps of my life are in his hands. And as you recognize him, would you surrender to him? Right now, just in a fresh way in your heart, just say, Lord, I'm yours. Everything. respond in just a moment as we sing your expression may be the same may be to pray may be to come forward and kneel at the front doesn't matter to me just respond to the Lord just respond to him if you came today and you don't know Jesus in a personal way as your Lord and Savior you don't know what it means be forgiven completely for all your sins. It would be my privilege. Caleb here is one of the pastors of the church. Caleb's here. There are others here. It would be our privilege to share with you how a person becomes a Christian and how your sins can be forgiven, how you can have a new life starting today. So you can come now. You can come after the service. Maybe you just recently prayed and you put your trust in Christ. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. And as the Lord leads, will you respond to him? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking it and applying it to our hearts as we asked you to do at the beginning. And Lord, as always, we welcome you here in these moments. Would you have your way among us? We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me?